as a clinician and a researcher, what I'm here to do is to explain why eye care policy should include brain mapping and retinal neuromodulation in order to help patients better. I want to thank Babak Kateb for allowing me this opportunity. I want to thank the Mind Eye Institute staff for helping support this venture and the entire, mind, uh, the entire brain mapping organization for promoting collaboration between different types of professionals, and all of you for listening. 2020 is considered perfect eyesight, and it has been since 1862, all the way to the present day. I started school 40 years ago, and I learned that light bounces off of targets, and it's dispersed on the lining of the eye, called the retina. And we learned that being able to read 2020 on the charts does, it means that you don't need any glasses. That type of testing shows that light came into the eye and was an input mechanism. But in reality, with new scientific discoveries, they're finding it's a two-way street. It's not just inputs. There was a book written called The Retina by John Dowling in 1987. It's a huge book that covered retinal processing in all different animals, including humans. 25 years later, in 2012, Dr. Dowling wrote a second edition. And in the preface, he wrote, I didn't realize that in 25 years there'd be so many new things about the retina that it would take another book. He was shocked because when he finished in 1987, he thought everything was covered. But in 2002, new cells were discovered that linked with hypothalamus functions. And now we're 10 years after his 2012 uh, second edition, and they found a new cell about four months ago in the retina because instead of microscopes, they're now using nanoscopes. And these cells are so tiny, nobody knew they existed, and now nobody knows what they're for. <clears throat> they're shaped like a handbell, and they're called campana cells, which is the word for bell in Italian. But the retina keeps having new discoveries, and they find more and more linkages into brain function. So if you take one point home from this speech today, it's that 2020 eyesight is something that's slow, and it's at a conscious level. The signals that are used to identify details clearly. Because it's slow, it, does, it means that we don't use it all the time. We use it when we choose to put attention on a detail. Here's an example of what happens through a closed eyelid. We were expecting that if you close your eyes, there isn't any eyesight and there's no reaction. You should be able to put anything in front of your eyes, and if the eyes are closed, nothing will happen. But since light still gets through a closed eyelid, here's what happens to sound perception. So I want you to close your eyes, and wherever you hear the bell, touch it with one finger. Ready? Touch it one finger. Now, he's not able to visualize now we're try the space tone. around him correctly. But this bell, he can, because the frequency so is show different. show you that on the other side. Find it here. He can't find the lower pitch, but he can find the higher find pitch. It Does it differently. Now, what happens here is that I put blue glasses on his face. So he has his eyes closed. The blue is a high frequency as opposed to red. And what it's doing is filtering only blue light getting into his brain. The reason I say brain is because the retina is a piece of the brain. And the blue light is going through his eyelids, and now he's able to find so that low pitch. The blue color makes a big difference because it's allowing the higher frequency sounds in and getting rid of the low frequency sounds. The point of that is that light traveling through a closed eyelid is affecting spatial perception and it's affecting brain processing. Retinal stimulation affects systems that are completely separate from eyesight. They're called non-image forming pathways, and they link directly with brain processing. So here's an example. You have image forming sections in your brain and non-image forming sections in your brain. The retina sends signals through the optic nerve to both places. 
The image forming is central eyesight when you identify details and peripheral awareness, which is awareness of the background. Now, some people think of periphery as way on the sides, but it's not necessarily. If you're looking at somebody's nose, then their earring might be in your peripheral eyesight. Peripheral really means whatever you're not paying direct conscious attention to. So if you're reading a book and you're looking at one word on the page, your peripheral eyesight is governing where the end of the line is and where the beginning of the next line is. So it's not way on the sides necessarily. Then you have these non-eyesight forming signals and they're linked with posture mechanisms, metabolism mechanisms for sleep, uh, mood regulation, and your fight or flight nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is very much entwined with, uh, with your retinal stimulation. Just think of what happens if you're driving and you see a police car chasing you all of a sudden. Your fight or flight turns on instantly and your heart rate goes up. The peripheral retina, which is different from the central retina, has both non-image forming as well as image forming signals. The image forming signals are used to d determine speed, location, size, and shape. And we use them all the time. For instance, in driving, the only time we use central eyesight in driving is to look at a license plate or a street sign or to find an address. Most of the time, driving requires peripheral eyesight. And the same with reading. If you're skimming and just scanning along on a book, you're using peripheral eyesight to judge the shape of words. You use your central eyesight when you're trying to proofread and look at commas or periods or, or small letter changes. 2020 eyesight isn't going to save this man. The key point I want you to take home is that 2020 eyesight is slow and it's processed at a conscious level. So his non eyesight, which are the fastest signals, those are involved with his posture, metabolism, and mood, as I just said. And his peripheral eyesight is busy looking at the speed of that bear, the location, the size, the shape. He doesn't care whether it's a bear or a gorilla. He doesn't care what color the, the bear's eyes are or how many teeth it has. That's what you'd use the 2020 eyesight for, to zoom in on identification of details. He's busy in survival mode, and it doesn't matter about the details matters about the concept. And his peripheral eyesight also has to keep him from falling off the cliff. So peripheral eyesight does a lot. Now emotions can override the 2020 eyesight. For instance, I once heard a noise in my basement and I opened the basement door and saw something in there that didn't belong in my basement. It was moving around and I got scared, slammed the door, and called the animal control people to come and get it out. And they came and they said, well, what is it? Is it a bird or is it an animal? And I said, well, I don't know. And they said, well, it's easy to tell. One has fur and one has feathers. And I said, but I don't know which one it had. And then they said, well, did one have a beak or did it have a tail? And I said, I don't know, I didn't see it. And I said, but I did know exactly where it was in my basement, how fast it was moving, how big it was, and what shape it was. And that's my peripheral eyesight. So when I opened the basement door, my peripheral eyesight glimpsed all of that in an instant. Because I was so scared, I shut the door so fast, I didn't choose to have my 2020 eyesight point my eyes and then look at it and then zoom in my focus. So peripheral eyesight triggers a lot of brain activity and a lot of decision making way before 2020 eyesight kicks in. And each person has a different reaction and response. So when we see patients and we're measuring their peripheral processing, then we, we look at what responses they have, and they're all individual. So when we talk about precision medicine and individualized treatment plans, you can do that from optometry also by stimulating peripheral signals and seeing how the responses are. So for instance, in the demonstration on the video, before when the person wasn't able to find a low-pitched bell and he was with blue glasses, there are other patients who can't find the high-pitched bell or other patients who can't find it just on one side or other patients who need green or red, something different. Each patient is a nice puzzle. So this is why eyewitness accounts differ. 
You can have a car accident or a robbery, and everybody is uniquely paying attention to different things that interest them or that scare them. And the policeman can come and try to get reports, and they'll have five different versions depending on what each person is paying attention to. A key point is that peripheral stimulation is activating brain processing without central eyesight necessarily being involved. And the people are not always concerned about the same details. I had a patient once in my office, and they left. And my employee said, did you see what they were wearing? And it was like, no, but did you see how pretty their eyelashes were? And she hadn't looked at their eyelashes. I hadn't looked at what they were wearing. Details are just whatever is individual to the person. Some people watch hairstyles. Some people watch fashion. Just different. There are some functions that are meant to be automatic, where they're running unconsciously. So for instance, we're not aware of swallowing until we're choking or having a sore throat. We're not aware of breathing until we have a stuffy nose. Can any of you tell me how many times you just breathed in the last minute? You're not paying attention to your breathing. It's just happening. And that's the neat thing about peripheral eyesight, that it's taken for granted all the time. We use it without ever thinking about it. If you're walking and you happen to hit a curb, you can be talking to somebody and your peripheral eyesight will, will see the curb and then make your step change. It's changing your posture and your movement so that you won't trip and fall. It'll see a pothole. It'll see, it'll see something flying at your head. Peripheral eyesight is always taken for granted until you have an autonomic dysfunction or a brain injury. Then all of a sudden, it's no longer there. It's disrupted. It doesn't work right. So why do we even care about peripheral eyesight? Well, eye examines didn't emphasize them when the 2020 was invented in 1862, but people then were looking at huge amounts of peripheral eyesight. Now, we're using peripheral eyesight very minimally. There's a picture here of the, the subway where people are on uh, phones and texting. If you look at the cars, when people back up, they have backup cameras, so they have just a little square to look at instead of searching around an entire environment. So the lack of peripheral eyesight development in children when they put you know, two-year-olds on iPads instead of playing outside. This may be a contributing factor for learning problems and even mental illness. Peripheral eyesight can come and go. It's not just one thing. It's depending upon stress levels and mental attention. So for instance, if you're in an argument with somebody, you should tune out your peripheral eyesight. If you're in an argument with somebody directly, you zoom your attention in to be paying attention just to that person and somebody else can walk near you and you wouldn't even be aware of it. Or in a restaurant, you could be interested in a conversation and somebody can all of a sudden uh, have the check placed by a waiter. The waiter can come and put the check down or fill your water up and you're not even aware of it. So the peripheral eyesight can tune out when you need to, when you're paying attention, but not in patients with brain injuries. I, I made a continuum of attention, and it goes from a pen light to a floodlight. So you can think of your peripheral retina. If all of the cells are activated in it, it's as if a floodlight is on. And you would use that to scan a room if you're trying to scan to find somebody. You would use the pen light portion of your retina and tune out the rest of it if you were trying to zoom your attention on one thing. Most people live in a comfort mode where their central eyesight is on, the targets that they want to look at, but their peripheral eyesight is still also on to, to make sure they're safe. After a brain injury, they're not able to calibrate the same way as a neurotypical person. So in general, a neurotypical person has this central comfort range and then they kind of go back and forth and mentally calibrate from the pen light end to the floodlight end. If you're too much at the floodlight end, people label you with attention deficit. If you're too much at the pen light end, people label you with, with autism. 
So most people stay kind of in the middle. But autonomic dysfunction and brain injury changes where a person is on that continuum and it hypersensitizes or hyposensitizes the periphery so that it's just not functioning efficiently anymore and people can't recalibrate. So they complain of light sensitivity, they bump into doorways, things like that. Eyeglasses can change that. The pen light people need the periphery awake, awakened and the floodlight people need it muted. This is the current world. It's filled with sensory bombardment. But typical eye testing may not thoroughly assess that. The eye testing on an eye chart was designed in 1862. Other things invented in the 1800s were the Morse code. Morse code is a way to avoid the Pony Express. Instead of writing a message, handing it to a person, having the person get on a horse and ride a day or two to give it to somebody, they develop Morse code. And you could click, click, click and have a message sent within minutes. It's a brilliant invention, but we no longer use it because it's technologically obsolete. In 1839, when they screened Ulysses S. Grant, they had him look at letters. The letter chart and identification and using your 2020 eyesight, that's been around for 180 years. Another incredible invention was the person who said, let me take a sound that's produced and capture it so that I could play it back later. I mean, that's incredible. But we don't use Victrola as much anymore because MP3 players are much better. The Victrola is technologically obsolete. Cars, somebody who said, let's have a horseless chariot. Instead of having horses pull us, let's have an engine that has horsepower built into it. Incredible invention, brilliant invention, but it's technologically obsolete because we've replaced it. Now the eye testing, this uh, instrument was invented in 1904. So the concept of the 2020 letter chart and how the, the gradation of letters were organized, matched with lenses, that's from 1862, but this is 1904. And it's just a fancy way to hold lenses so that you don't have to say which is better, one or two, by pulling single lenses out. But in 100 years, from 1904 to 2022, it's very minimally changed. And when you use that, it, you're showing just central targets. You're looking at letters, and you're, that's only 6% of your view. There's 94% of the view that's not being paid attention to. Here's the timeline I was mentioning. The lenses were put together 1838. The eye chart was calibrated to match the lenses in 1862. The instrument for looking at your uh, eyesight to put in front of your face, that's called a phoropter, and it was from 1904. Now, as you see the iterations that go through 2021, the instrument is sleeker and fancier and now computerized, but it's still doing the same thing. It's still blocking off your eyesight. We're still measuring central eyesight, and we're still doing it with conscious attention or ignoring the peripheral eyesight. It's being blocked off. Now, some of you might say, but wait, my eye doctors test my peripheral eyesight. But when they do the peripheral eyesight test in the offices, it's meant at a conscious level and it's designed specifically to find pathology. So it's looking for damage to peripheral eyesight. And they say, well, look straight ahead, and push a button when you hear when you see something out of the corner of your eye, but you're consciously paying attention to where is the little dot coming from. So it's not the same as when you're walking around and not thinking of your peripheral eyesight. So the central 2020 eyesight, which I want you to go home realizing is slow and at a conscious level, it's part of the what do I see? It's an identification process. The peripheral eyesight as I said, is used for pathology, but it's part of the where and when, the space and time judgments. And it's more of a navigational process. So you have identification and navigation. You know this from when you get new glasses. Sometimes they often feel funny, but the typical person can adjust to a prescription design for the central eyesight. 
So this, the eye exam is fantastic for the bulk of the population. So the central 2020 eyesight, which I want you to go home realizing is slow and at a conscious level, it's part of the what do I see? It's an identification process. The peripheral eyesight, as I said, is used for pathology, but it's part of the where and when, the space and time judgments. And it's more of a navigational process. So you have identification and navigation. You know this from when you get new glasses. Sometimes they often feel funny, but the typical person can adjust to a prescription design for the central eyesight. So the, the eye exam is fantastic for the bulk of the population, but an overwhelming percentage of brain injury patients or people with autonomic dysfunctions or people with even long COVID, those are people that have a lot more trouble adapting to changes because the peripheral retinal signals going in is confusing. So what I'm proposing, since the retina is part of the brain and made out of brain tissue, is to map the brain onto the retina, use brain mapping at the retinal level. There's a point-to-point -point correspondence with cortical sections. And if you did that, you could then use it to zero in on brain injury. Um, I have a speech tomorrow on how you can use the retina as a poor man's MRI. And you can selectively activate different spots on the retina to route through various cortical pathways. It would facilitate an individualized rehabilitation. So why is retinal mapping an important part of brain mapping? Because it's non-invasive. The newest research shows that retinal degeneration is a reflection of what's happening parallel to brain degeneration. So there's studies that show that in multiple sclerosis, not only does the brain have uh, signals that are not working right, but the retina is changing its thickness. In dementia, the retina gets thin, but always in the same spots. It, that's with Parkinson's and dementia. There's studies on schizophrenia, studies on bipolar disease, looking at retinal tissue. And now they're trying to figure out, is it the chicken or the egg? Does the retina degenerate first and then the brain, or does the brain degenerate before the retina? But it's it's an incredible avenue for research. And few people realize that eyeglasses are one way to directly alter brain activity because the clarity of a target is just one aspect of visual processing. Visual processing is an enormous thing. So even when you have 20-20 eyesight, which is slow and at a conscious level, you might still need glasses for other reasons. We're not where we were 40 years ago when I learned that 2020 meant you didn't need glasses. You could use them to help you listen better, like in the video. You could use them to feel more comfortable. It's just no longer acceptable to assess only central eyesight. The policy needs to be changed, and it's vital to adapt the eye exam for patients who have autonomic dysfunctions, attention disorders, brain injury, long COVID, and autism. Now, how can we change the policy for clinical practice to catch up with current science? There's a lot of ways. We can standardize the curriculum to emphasize the overlap between professions. We can use occupational therapy codes that are already existing, talking about sensory processing, to be used by eye care professionals. We can create new diagnosis codes to talk about these non-image forming disruptions. Uh, in glaucoma, for instance, one of the first bunch of cells that's damaged in the retina are the ones that are linked with sleep. So a lot of glaucoma patients have sleep problems the, because these particular cells are, are affected. There's also incorporation of peripheral awareness into the assessment in a standard eye exam. Up until now, people thought of neurology and cardiology and optometry as being very separate, but they're not because when you change lenses in either optometry or ophthalmology, you're affecting the brain directly, and you're instantly triggering the central nervous system and getting reactions. 
They have to be thought of as together. So one way to do this is to start with collaboration. And I think that can begin with brain researchers needing to include the effects of eyeglass prescriptions on neuromodulation. And optometrists needing to learn more about these non-image forming pathways. Collaboration between the scientific community and rehab professionals and mental health care providers and legislatures has got to make a better quality of life for patients. It's going to save health care costs, and it's going to increase productivity, and it can take some people off of disability. We have so many patients on disability that you know, they have uh, mismatches between their auditory maps of the world and their visual maps, between their right side and their left side, between central and peripheral processing. And when we put specific types of glasses on them, all of a sudden their brains work differently. They can go back to work and be comfortable instead of uncomfortable. The Society for Brain Mapping and Therapeutics that all of you, oops, that all of you are a part of is a different kind of organization and it's based on collaboration between professions. This is the wave of the future. It started with engineers, neurosurgeons, and uh, scientists. And it's now expanded worldwide to include things, the military and different brain initiatives. It's got a brain technology innovation park that's just on the cusp of happening. And that's going to be even more collaboration. It's going to allow a platform for eye care to be one of the first stops for brain function. When Babak made this organization and talked about breaking boundaries of science, he wasn't kidding. I started in this organization in 2009, and there were about 20 people. And now, before COVID, there were hundreds of people. And even now, there's about eight or 900 speakers from all over the world in so many disciplines. And it's all under one umbrella of the brain and the, and the spinal cord and the retina, because all of those together are the central nervous system. So we're here today, but where tomorrow? Today, we know that retinal activity involves much more than 2020 eyesight because 2020 eyesight is slow and conscious. But there's also these unintended consequences of glasses. For instance, there's a 1969 episode of Marcus Welby. And for those of you who are too young to know who Marcus Welby is, he was the older version of House. There's a, there's a TV show called House, and where uh, House figured out things that nobody else could figure out. And Marcus Welby was a similar TV show from earlier where he was a grandfatherly figure uh, who always solved things. And the episode of Marcus Welby shows a lady saying to, Mar I mean a man, I'm sorry, a man coming to Marcus Welby and saying, thank you, Dr. Welby. You showed me that if I got glasses, my digestive problems would go away. And in 1969, Marcus Welby knew that if you put glasses on somebody, their digestive system would change. But here we are, you know, 50, some 60 years later, and we don't know that, but it's true. And we, I had a patient who was a bird watcher, and she used to always have trouble figuring out where to find the birds. She could hear them, but she couldn't place where they were. She was like the patient I had where they couldn't find the bell. They heard it. And we put glasses on her, and she came back, and she said, oh, my goodness, now when I hear a bird, I can turn my binoculars immediately and see them because I know where the sound is. So the concept of next, the, where, where we are in the future is that visual stress induces physical reactions. So when we take away visual stress, we're going to be able to alter people's lives and help people in ways they've never realized before. Because people don't realize if they see 2020 out of each eye, but one eye sees it easily and the other eye sees it with struggle, they're still graded as 2020, but there's a circuitry imbalance. So the brain is under total stress. So the challenging patients require increased sophistication of testing and treatment. So I hope you're going away realizing that even if they're 2020, they still might need glasses to function more comfortably and efficiently. So how are we able to help and who can we help? We're able to help people with learning disabilities, mental illnesses, 
brain injury, PTSD for veterans, autism, genetic problems, anybody whose brain has not learned certain systems that it hasn't developed properly, or somebody whose brain has been disrupted with the development. Trauma patients are like that for the PTSD. There's something that has disrupted the linkage between peripheral and central eyesight. So for instance, in a veteran, their peripheral eyesight isn't taken for granted because it's always on hyper alert. It's always looking for a sniper, for somebody around. Peripheral processing is crucial, and yet we shouldn't any longer, for the brain injured population, be blocking it off when we test them. So eye care provides this missing link by changing the brain through retinal neuromodulation. For instance, we know 85% of people with high blood pressure have no known cause. But changing light on the, on the retina directly affects the central nervous system. So wouldn't it make sense to do some research on maybe eyeglasses can help the patients where blood pressure isn't regulated easily with medications? There also might be other systems that might be affected, such as digestion. So we have to leave 2020 in the 20th century because we're using testing that was designed in the 19th century, but we're currently in the, 2021st, in the 21st century. So here we are using 160-year-old testing that was brilliant at the time but needs a change now. So I urge you to help us at the, as the brain mapping group change policy. I want to thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, you can write me at info at mindeye.com.